I'm Melanie Neneva. I'm with Accenture Analytics. And I'll talk to you about early prediction of cardiac arrest, or code blue, as, whoops, as it's known. You've probably seen um, uh, medical shows, right? Uh, somebody crashes, there's a code blue announcement, uh, um, a cart is rushed to the hospital, a team converges, doctors, patients, they try to revive the uh, patient. So that's, that's what we're trying to predict early. We use, we're doing this uh, using electronic medical records. This work was done um, with uh, Ram Samanchi, Sam Adhikari, Alan Lin, and Ray Ghani as a part of the Data Science for Social Good Summer Fellowship, and I'll say a few words about that um, at the end of the um, slides as well. So what are we trying to do? So our goal is to develop an early alerting system to flag the patients who are at risk of entering this code blue. Um, and more than that, we're trying to make it a practical system. So we're trying to build models that balance the high recall in predicting all code blues with very low false alarms, because this is something that we want to put in a hospital or in all hospitals next to each patient's bed. Um, and this is going to be one other system that beeps at nurses, that sends some sort of score, right, some sort of alert prediction. Um, and I think we know that uh, the tolerance for um, high false positive rates is very low. Um, this was done with um, doctors at uh, North Shore Hospital, and, uh, which is in Chicago. Um, and we have also uh, consulted and collaborated with additional Code Blue um, emergency doctors, nurses, and other staff. So I'll tell you a little bit about our data. So we have data on 133,000 patients. And as you might expect, the occurrence of Code Blue is actually quite rare, right? So this is a perfect example of the rare disease. So half a percent of all the patients actually go into Code Blue. Um, we also have data on demographics, men, women, age range, and so on. Their hospitalization history through the years, and uh, their vitals and lab results. And this is just a snapshot of what some of that data looks like, um, where the red line is the cardiac event occurring in the hospital, the code blue being called, and what happens afterwards. Um, and just a couple of words on why this is an important problem. So. As you can imagine, this is a very disruptive, very expensive procedure in hospitals. Um, it's an unpredictable event that pages an entire group of medical professionals to a specific location. They have to uh, drop whatever else they're doing, right, because this is their first priority. And even so, with this effort, and sometimes the attempt to resuscitate the patient lasts 45 minutes, even so, the mortality rate is over 85%. Right, so it's very expensive, very disruptive, and very hard to reverse once you catch it after the fact. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, catch it early, and we're trying to predict as far ahead as we can. So maybe we can predict an hour ahead, we can, maybe we can predict four hours ahead, um, and maybe you're wondering whether, uh, the, the other question, right? First, can we do it, and second, if we can do it, what, how is that useful? So maybe if you know an hour ahead, it doesn't help you, right? Maybe it's too late then. Um, it turns out that actually it is not too late. And the earlier you can predict, the better, with, within reasons, right? If you say in two days this person, <laughs> patient is likely to have an event, it's not very useful because a lot can happen in two days. But um, if you say an hour, uh, two, three, four, even four hours ahead, it's very useful. You could move the patient to a different ward. You can give more supervision. Uh, or you can start some sort of intervention uh, treatment. So more about the data. This is what the um, vitals and lab results data looks like. Um, I know it's very small. You don't have to um, read just kind of as a, to give you an idea. So in, in black, we have the occurrence up until the code blue, and in red, we have that after. This is one part of the data, but it's kind of easy to visualize. And you can see that some of these clearly show a pattern, what happens after. Some of them uh, kind of continue, right, like this one. Um, and some of them don't really change much an hour, four hours, eight hours uh, before the event. So how do we model? So based on the characteristics of the patients, 
leading up to that event, can we predict this ahead of time? And we use standard classification techniques, just machine learning classification techniques. And there's a couple of interesting points that make this a less straightforward kind of problem. Um, first of all, what do you use as a counterexample? Right? So it's, it's sort of easy when you do see a code blue, right? You have a patient, patient has checked in, something suddenly happens, you have a recording of that. Uh, you can uh, find all the patterns, you can construct the features that lead up to that, you can describe the event. But what do you compare that um, to for somebody who has not, right? What do you train the, the model for uh, as a negative example, right? Somebody who has not had um, a code blue event. And this might be a patient that later, in a day or in two and in five, has a code blue, but at that point has not had. So here's an approach that we use. Um, if we predict at T minus two hours, um, what we look at is a patient, another patient, no event occurs, we pick an arbitrary point of that patient's stay, we go back two hours, we compute off of that, and we do that for one, two, three, four, and so on hours ahead of time. Um, a little bit on feature extraction, I mentioned some of it. There's basically three types of features that we use. Um, the first one is based on the um, observations as you saw briefly in a previous slide, and we construct all kinds of um, new features out of it. Uh, we, we put sliding windows, we, we compute minimums, maximums, averages, <laughs> standard deviations, and so on. Um, as well as the direction uh, in which the signal is changing. Um, another part that makes this a little trickier is that we can't really use signal processing um, techniques for this because the data is sparse, it's pretty inconsistent, we don't have data for uh, let's say a full 24 hours or a full hour sometimes. Um, we have a patients who have the test, patients who don't have the test, patients who are continually monitored for specific, let's say if their blood pressure is constantly taken, some of them aren't, right? So this is, uh, this is something that makes this a uh, bit of a unique problem, kind of a mixture um, of problems. We also have admission data, as you would imagine, admission type, previous encounters, and so on and what happens in the hospital's previous um, number of surgeries, number of previous code blues, and so on. And I'll give you um, a spoiler when we review what features are most um, useful in the resulting model. Um, probably is not a surprise, but the number of previous code blues, very important in predicting who's about to have another code blue. So here's the methods that we are Comparing so the SVM method is the the new one that uh, we applied to this data We also applied sparse logistic regression just to see what a simpler method does and the third one is called Modified early warning score muse and this is the default that's used in hospitals right now, right? So hospitals are not completely Toolless in this they have a very simple mostly they have a very simple table that is easy to read, easy for nurses to compute, and this is what they go by to estimate the, the risk for a patient. So you want to have zero points, that's the best scenario, and if you are in any way outside of the ranges, you add a point, for example, if your rate is 15 to 20 or less than nine, you know, and so on. And so then with the number of points that the patient ends up, the higher the number of points, the higher the risk, and so the patient gets monitored. So. It's a pretty simple model, but it's cheap, it's fast, right, and uh, potentially it works well. So we're comparing with that. Um, some additional parameters that we're considering. We spent a lot of time thinking how to construct the negative data set. Um, at what point do we train uh, for non-code blue patients? Do we take their data just as they enter the hospital, so maybe up at about uh, 25th, 25th percentile of their stay, where they may be at their sickest. Maybe that's not a good representation of what a non code blue patient looks like. Do we take it at half the stay? Do we take it towards the end of the stay when they are um, mostly recovered, uh, presumably? What should our case to control ratio be for training? I already mentioned this is a um, case of a rare disease problem. So, we have experimented with all these and, and uh, mixed and matched to see which one is the best. Uh, the system that we are building 
mimics the real world, right? So our methods are evaluated on every hour of the year of 2011, and we have three years of continuous data. So we take one full year and we pretend as if every as if our system is running every hour. We see what our performance would have been. Um, every patient is evaluated, and we track mostly two measures of accuracy: so recall and false positive rate. Um, and we have relatively good accuracy. You can see the SVM model is at the top, the logistic regression, then mu is towards the bottom. Uh, if we take a quick look at the false positive rate, also, I guess not surprisingly, at least to us, the false positive rate of the SVM is the lowest. Then we've got mu, then we've got logistic regression on top. Um, this is a picture of both of them together. Um, Another thing we look at is the ROC score. So you're familiar with how this works. Diagonal is, is basically random as you're going through your space of examples. Um, so the MUSE performance is better than random. Um, and this is the, uh, the different lines of the hours. So hour one, two, three, four. So how many hours ahead of time of the actual event are you able to predict? And what your accuracy is at each one of those. Um, however, our favorite method, SVM, does better um, and does quite a bit better, as you can see. Um, the, this is both of them at one line. I don't think we need to go over that. It's a bit of a crowded graph, but in, in the dotted lines in between, you can see that logistic regression is kind of a compromise between the two um, and is, um, yeah, it's, it's easy to compute, but not, not that powerful. Um, Something else we looked at is how soon do we need to relearn the model? So, so what's our temporal decay, right? Is this something that, are these patterns that change? So in a year, the patient's behavior and susceptibility to code blue uh, is quite different than it used to be a year ago, or does that hold? Um, so this is kind of the overall pattern um, of what happens ahead, the, the different colors of the models, one hour ahead, two, three, four. And on the bottom, you have the months, the time difference, difference in months. So not surprising. Um, it holds for a while. So you probably don't need to retrain one month later, two months later, three months later. And then towards the end of the year, it starts sloping down for most of the models. Um, we don't know what happened with that uh, one um, turquoise point that is quite a bit lower between months seven and nine. Um, data mystery. Um, and I promised that I would also show you the important predictors that we came up with um, as, as, as the top features for a prediction. And this is something um, I think we're all familiar, familiar working in the health uh, domain. Black box models are mistrusted, right, and, and potentially rightfully so. Um, and medical um, folks often want to see something more concrete, right? How is the decision actually made? So when we compiled the, the list of the most um, predictive features um, and showed it to the doctors, um, it made sense to them. So some of, some of it even made sense to us, right? Number of previous code blues, yes, that's, that's a no-brainer. It's, it's a very rare feature, but when you have it, it's great. Um, but the other ones, um, the doctors were able to look at it and say, oh, this actually makes sense. Um, we don't look at it this way, but, but I can see that, that this would come up. So um, points, uh, points for us on that. Um, this is something that we're in the process of implementing um, in hospitals in the Chicago area at the North Shore Hospital. Um, and we're trying to work out the details of the model. So how sensitive does it need to be? At what point do we need to trigger an alert? Um, and what would be most useful? To the clinician. So this is actually a, about to be a productionized system. Um, something that you might have noticed is that we, we actually have limited types of data. So we don't have medication data. Um, we don't have data on what happens after what happened after the uh, patient checked in in the previous visit. Um, so we're missing something that doctors uh, consider to be pretty important. So. Going forward, um, the, the work that we're planning on 
doing is adding additional data fields. And that data exists or exists to um, a large degree. And we could add it. So this is not a limitation with the model. It's just limitation with the data we had access to it at the point when we're doing the research. Um, additional data, additional fields, and uh, parameters of implementation in hospital learning systems, which is something that I talked about before. Um, I think I saved a few minutes, so I'm going to um, go to the questions part, but I will flash this slide as we're going through the questions. This is um, a little bit more information on the data science for social good, the summer fellowship, how to get involved, what it is, um, how to look up more information. And uh, we're looking forward to more mentors, more uh, scholars, and more good work on this. So questions. Question. Okay, great. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much for that. That's very important stuff you're doing. You touched on the end at the concept of black box models and mistrust. And I wonder if you could comment a little more on the experience you had with the clinicians and what they thought of the model. And following on from that, if, if it is OK for people to, if you find that they trust the black box model quite comfortably, could you just go the whole hog and just do a full on ensemble, perhaps, of a whole bunch of different machine learning models that are good at predicting different types of code blue situations? Right, yeah. You know, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to, to deal with black box models. Um, we've, had, we've had examples of models that weren't constructed well, that, that gave good results at first glance, um, and that we knew we should have been suspicious of. Um, so w we know not to just roll our eyes at the doctors and say, well, why, won't you, why don't you just trust us, right? Um, so what what we've what we've um, discovered that works quite well is to say we're not we're not trying to supersede the doctor we're not trying to remove the doctor we're trying to take away the part of their jobs which is tedious and data intensive um, and is something that could provide additional guidance to them right so that's how we're framing this so we ran we ran a different model that was able to give um, the the top features and so that kind of explained a little bit of what we're doing. And we're also saying, we're not going to force you to take an action based on the model. We'll provide additional input to the nurses and to the doctors for something that you don't need to keep in mind, right? So that's, that's the best way we've, we've figured out how to work with that. And there's probably a better a kind of better practices that we can all as a community work out. And if, if you guys have any better experiences, I'd love to hear. OK. Um, hi. Uh, do you think you uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the observation? I mean, the time interval between mm -hmm. the observation when when making a prediction mm -hmm. uh, was changed to uh, I guess sixty minutes and then two hours. Mm -hmm. So, do you think while using SVM um, and the more you increase the uh, time interval between the observation window and the prediction window, mm -hmm. uh, performance of SVM degrades? Yes, actually, we saw that. Uh, a few slides ago. Let me see if I can go up to that. It is, it is quite minor. We were actually surprised that it was doing quite well. Um, and according to the clinicians, the sooner you can give the prediction, the better. So the trade-off is worth it. It's not, it's not a lot of trade-off, but even if you do have a trade-off, it's worth to be able to alert four hours ahead of time versus wait to be sure about an hour ahead of time. I mean, about a minute ahead of time, you're most sure, but that's not useful at all, right? the morning, uh, to the coffee break. <laughs> yes, I, I'd love to answer more questions okay. over the coffee break. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Thank you.